Well, Frank, I've had everybody on from your organization. It's about time I've had Jim Ursay and Chris Ballard and multiple players and Darius Leonard, so it's great to have you. So, you know, the NFL, they always have this stat, Frank, about fumbles, that, you know, some years you fumble, some years you don't. Some years you recover them, some years you don't. There's a randomness to fumbles in the NFL. There's also a randomness to injuries in the NFL, and you I swear to God, the last couple of years, you've had some bad breaks. Your very best players, Darius Leonard, uh, Quentin Nelson, uh, now Carson Wentz. Uh, you know, listen, Andrew Luck retiring. It, it's do you, do you feel sometimes like, okay, I've withstood the bad luck. The good luck's coming here real quick. It is coming, and I'm and, and hoping it's here uh, this year. And, and actually, I'm trying, to, as you would expect, Colin, I'm I'm, I'm trying to convince myself, and I think I'm doing a pretty good job of it, that getting these over early in camp, when you look at a Carson situation and Quentin situation, you could easily make a case that, hey, these things were probably going to go sometime this year, so better now than midseason. So that's the way we're looking at it. Listen, Frank, you were a big guy. I don't remember you getting hurt a lot. I remember your game. And, you know, there, it's, there are players sometimes, you know, they're a little injury prone. I was a big proponent of Carson Wentz because I think you guys are so well run and so smart that in this league, I mean, Frank, you can do everything right. But if you don't have some juice at quarterback, it's tough. It really is. Um, Were you sick to your stomach with the Carson Wentz thing? I mean, your immediate thought when he's limping and something pops, I mean, just as as a guy who played in this league, what was your first five, ten seconds like? Yeah, it really wasn't that bad. I, you know, I've trained myself, I think, pretty well, you know, not to overreact, you know, knee-jerk reaction. You know, just certainly been around long enough to, you know, see it's a long season. You know, you got to take the long view, I'm sure. And even if it had, even if it had been a worst-case scenario that was going to require him being out for an extended period of time or something even worse than it was, um, still take the long view. Uh, excited about our team. I understand, like you're saying, Colin, that uh, I understand the importance of the quarterback position. But, you know, I, I, I've also seen the other side of it that, you know, sometimes the team just needs to rise up and, and, and figure out a way to win football games. And I'm just confident that we were going to do that. Although I am optimistic we'll get Carson back sooner rather than later. You've had injuries in your career. Everybody gets hurt. Is it a day-to-day thing, Frank? Do, do you feel like, hey, I'm not going to hover. I'm not going to helicopter coach here. I'm going to give him space. He'll come to me. Or do you just – do you have the kind of relationship – I mean, because this thing is live. This is fluid. The Wentz injury situation, how do you monitor it? How do you, you know, modify coaching to it? Like, How does it day-to-day work? Um, you know, just standing in communication. I mean, like you said, because of the – how good the existing relationship is. Um, yeah, I don't cover. I don't, I'm not always asking them how, you know, how, how are you today? You know, I talk to the docs and the trainers every day. So I know that, but um, yeah, we've just continued Colin to work and preparing for the season. Um, you know, when, when we're getting together and talking, whether it be in a quarterback meeting or in a little side meeting that the two of us are having, um, I'm not sitting there talking about his rehab process. He's got the trainers to do that with. I'm, we're talking about plays and game plans and progressions and drills and, you know, how we get better as a quarterback. So we don't, I don't want to let this time go by while he's rehabbing and doing those other things. We still got to keep that mind going. We still got to be playing that game in our mind. We still got to be like we're preparing for a game this week. I just think you got to keep that edge mentally on football. Because, um, like you said, because of the schedule that we have um, and the quality of the opponents um, early on, you know, we, uh, we don't want to take a couple weeks to figure this thing out. And, or we don't want to take a couple weeks to figure out having a new quarterback, whether Carson plays week one or two or three or whatever it is. You know, we want to be ready to go and hit the ground running from day one. And so if he is going to be ready earlier than expected, we got to keep him going mentally. Clearly. Um, you have connected with him on an emotional level that no other coach has. When you go back to Carson's relationship with you initially, um, was it connect at first sight? Did it take time? What was the breakthrough, the epiphany that you're like, he trusted you, you trusted him in Philly? Yeah, I mean, it it was on every level. Um, You know, there's been a lot of talk that, you know, spiritually we kind of, you know, connect there. 
that's true. But it, and that's important. And I think that's a big part of why we connect. But um, from a football standpoint, I can't emphasize to you enough how much we connect just X's and O's, the way we see the game, um, the way we see the passing in, the way we see protections, the way we, the philosophy of how to play quarterback. Um, you know, this is just one of those guys that as soon as I started talking to him, it was like, oh, wow. Yeah, we're, we're totally got the same vibe, the same wavelength about how to play, how to play this most important of position. And, um, you know, for me, that's come from being around a lot of great ones and playing the game myself and at that position, not that I was ever at that level, but I've been around a lot of great ones and I get excited um, about when I get around a guy like Carson, who I think thinks like those guys. You know, it's funny uh, in golf, they call it the yips. Uh, we just saw this Olympian, Simone Biles, they call it the twisties where you just, you get in the air and you're like, I've lost my confidence. Um, you know, we know basketball players they get in the zone they get out of the zone right but in football we, we also know in baseball i can remember steve Sachs struggled making the throw second to first it happens like we all get it in football we just think oh these guys just these quarterbacks drop back and it's like no no there's anxiety last year with carson wentz there were moments and i thought Oh shit! He there's he's got a little bit of the golfer yips here on, on stuff out in the flat, like just easy stuff for him, and he was a little broken. And then the stories come out that you know it was not a great situation for Doug Peterson for everybody involved. Um, how do you? I don't know how often you've dealt with it. How do you get him back in the right tunnel in the right lane? We get with every other sport. We get that you can get off out of a zone. How do you get him back? Yeah, well, I think that's a great that's a great point you're making, and those examples are great examples. Um, you know, most of those examples are a little bit more not individual. You know, like the Simone Biles, that, that's an individual sport. The, the the throw to first base, you know, that's kind of a one aspect of a deal where you know I think what we're talking about here a little bit. What I think you're alluding to is a, a, a guy losing confidence and you know getting out of his rhythm and. That certainly was said last year. The thing about playing quarterback is you're so dependent on so many other people. Um, and so, you know, uh, the way to get it back is, first of all, the change of environment. So, you know, sometimes a change of environment is a good thing. And, um, you know, we, we all know that what Doug Peterson did in Philadelphia and helping that and leading that team and organization to a world championship, he obviously put together a world-class environment. But then over sometimes things change and and the, and people change and and it just doesn't things go south for whatever the reasons are and it was just the right time I think for for the uh, change for Carson and I think the culture here and the team and the roster here is is just built for he's the right piece to plug in for us I think he feels that I even think this area of the country is a guy from North Dakota so you know even in the Midwest even though I I think Carson did a great job of connecting with the Philly fans and, and becoming part of that city. Um, I, I think this is a natural home to him. And then as far as a player, Colin, you know, you just go back to the basics. We, we, we go back to ground up. And um, I've said here in the media that I don't like to think that he was broken. It's just a question of resetting, refocusing, put him in the right environment and, and just go through that process day by day. And I'm expecting big things. Um, your opening schedule is – uh, to be diplomatic, brutal. I mean, you guys got no breaks in your first five weeks. I do think you can win the division and not have Carson Wentz around for a month. I do. I think you're really well coached. I think you have great line play, uh, some of that drafting, some trades, some just development, but both lines are really solid. Jonathan Taylor, end of the year, Michael Pittman, really, you know, ex it, you really saw stars emerging. Mm -hmm. Um, I could also make an argument, as good as you are, Frank, you go one in five or, you know, one in four in this league. It, it is, you are, it is hard to get back. Is it possible? Jacob Eason, Sam Ellinger, young guys don't have a lot of reps that maybe the answer is not currently in camp and somebody coming outside in may very well, based on the difficulty of schedule, may be the answer. Yeah, well, you know, first of all, 
con- you know, first of all, yeah, it's a legitimate question. I mean, it's a question you have to, I mean, you can't ignore that question. So, and it's not being ignored. Um, but, you know, we have to have a, a maturity here and a perspective here that we can do that. We can keep our head down with the guys that we got and feel confident the guys that we got. You know, I understand that Chris Ballard is a GM. He can have that perspective um, and, and be thinking and, and we're, of course, have those conversations. But 99% of what I'm thinking is, you know, our roster is our roster. Let's get these guys ready to play. And and then secondly, I mean, I'm hope, hoping the best with Carson. I'm not, we're not eliminating the possibility of him playing week one. Um, we're still a long way from there and not even close to making that determination. But, um, you know, there's still a chance. So um, we'll just stay the course here. Chris and I will have the appropriate conversations at the appropriate time. Um, but we're not there yet. I was kind of surprised. I thought you'd win last year, but I, th- I really thought you gave Buffalo a real scare, and it was a real football team. And Philip Rivers is just, it doesn't look like it should work, and it just does. I mean, it looks painful when he throws, and he's not a great athlete. Just go back one year. Did you ever have doubts? I mean, he's retired. Was there ever a moment, or or did you know really early this Philip thing's going to work for us really well? Yeah, no, I, I felt it would work for us. Um, you know, when I looked at his film from the year before that we got him, you know, when when they struggled out west and for a lot of different reasons, almost a little bit like what happened in Philadelphia. I mean, different scenarios, but. It, it was not the best year for the team and, and the organization out there with Philip. And um, what I, I really, Colin, looked at his close, at his tape very closely from the last couple of years to just make a determination of how much physically did he have left in his body. And because I coached him for three years prior, like I can look at his tape real closely and, and, I, and I know, I mean, I know what I see. And it came uh, very apparent quickly that when I looked at the tape, his arm strength and who he was as a quarterback, it really had not diminished even since I had been there. So uh, I wasn't concerned physically about his arm strength. And like you said, he was never a guy that was going to move out of the pocket anyway. So whether he was 32 or 38, it didn't make a difference. He was going to be the same guy as long as his arm strength was there. And, um, and you just know Philip has a passion for the game and he's got elite leadership. And with no offseason, he came in and connected with the team in a, in, a, in a very significant way. It was a great year and a fun year for, for him and for us. And, um, yeah, he's a, unique, he's a unique guy. So fun to be around, so fun to coach. You know, Jimmy Johnson, I once asked him, describe leadership. And he said, I don't really know what it is. Hmm. He goes, I just know Troy Aikman was it. Yeah. <laughs> right? And Philip is out there talking trash. And, you know, uh, Andrew Luck conversely, uh, yeah. very quiet, almost a throwback, you yeah. know, good, you know, interesting kind of intellect and interesting personality. If I, as I said to you, I, I, and I have never met Carson, what kind of a leader is he? What, what, what's the juice for him there? What is yeah. no, I, I love that question. And I'll, for, let me give a 15 second context that really it's a unique situation here. This is our fourth year and our fourth different quarterback, as you said, Colin. You know, starting with Andrew, then Jacoby, then Philip, and now Carson. And we've had four really strong leaders. But Carson's Carson's juice as a leader, first of all, just comes from his competitive fire. I mean, and secondly, I think it comes from a, a fearlessness that he plays with and that you feel in the hope. Thirdly, I, I think he's a great teammate. He's not he's not one of these stat oriented guys that he cares about winning and I just knowing him personally, I know he deeply cares about his teammates. We all have different personalities and how we express that. But um, on the football field, I made a statement earlier to the press that when Carson walks out on the field, certain guys just, you can feel their energy. You can just feel it. And I've, I said to Colts Nation, I was like, hey, when this guy, when you watch this guy walk onto Lucas Oil Stadium, and it's just warm-ups. It, we're not even at the game yet, but you watch him warm up. You watch him walk around on the bench. You can just tell this guy has that it factor. He's got that juice about him. He's got an energy about him that guys feel. And um, 
his love for the game, his love for teammates, and his love for the big situations. I don't think there's any situation that's too big for him. I think he, I think he loves the big moments. You know, I remember about seven, eight years ago, your name coming up. I was talking to an executive, and he said the next great coach is going to be Frank Reich. And I'm like, the quarterback? You mean uh, yeah, number fourteen, the guy? <laughs> and he's like, he's like, yeah, he's going to. And I'm like, you know, I'd never heard that. And he said, you know, this is a weird league. Some guys get chances early. Some guys get chances late. You would put the time in. You had played. You had had great mentors. Was there a moment for you that you just didn't think it was going to happen? You, you just put your head to the pillow one night, and you're sitting there thinking, God, I've done it all right. I've checked all the damn boxes. I, am I going to get this shot? Yeah, no. I mean, after the 17th season, when uh, you know being part of a world championship and and not initially not getting an interview initially, um, you know, the cycle had kind of come and gone, and everyone was hired. And that's crazy. And it was over. And uh, but here was a great thing about it, Colin. I had uh, my wife and I had had a sit down as I saw that unfolding in 17. Um, we kind of had this powwow one night about well, here it is. We just you know everything's going right, and it but not getting any interviews at the time for whatever reason, you know. And, uh, you know, I just had that look in the mirror and like, I'm good. You know, I love what I'm doing. I love coaching football, whether I, you know, whether I be quality control or whether I, you know, be the quarterback coach, the offense. I love being around the guys. I love the game. Um, I love everything about it. And so um, I'm thankful the opportunity came. I'm thankful that Chris Bauer, Mr. Ursay, you know, uh, after what the unique situation that happened here gave me a call and that, um, and I, cause I believe we're on the right path. I believe that, you know, together with our owner and with Chris, uh, I believe we have a vision and, and a blueprint for what we're trying to do. And I believe it's taking, I believe the players here feel that and know that, and we have the right kind of leadership to take us down. And I'm talking about player leadership to take us down the road we want to go. You remind me of Tony Dungy. Uh, you don't toot your own horn. I'm not just you know blowing your smoke, but you're kind of a guy's guy. And in this world we live in now, Frank, if you don't have the agent, you're not tooting your horn, you're not on social, that is a component now, right? And that's not really who you are. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I appreciate the comparison to Tony Dungy. Obviously, I've worked for him for a, a short time and and he would be a guy who I want, would want to pattern myself after. As you said, Colin, you know, I'm not a big yeller and screamer. Certainly, I don't think anybody would want to take pride in being a, you know, self-promoter, but that's definitely not something that I want to be good at. Um, you know, what I want to be good at is being a good teammate. You know, I want to be a good teammate. Um, and I love being around guys who love to play football. I love guys who love practicing football. And, um you know, I'm not outwardly emotional or or um, yeller or screamer, but uh, I would hope that the guys here would say, you know, you can you can be steady, you can be even keel, but yet you can feel an intensity and a passion for the game, for people that you don't have to yell and scream. Um, I appreciate the guys who do yell and scream. I want a few of those guys on the staff. Uh, <laughs> I don't want everybody to be like me, so. We, you know, we, we got some guys who can raise their voice and, and do that, but I, we all do it our own way. And, uh, you know, you got to be comfortable in your own skin and, 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 and do it the right way. But it really, no matter whether you're loud and vocal or a little bit more subdued, you got to have that passion. You got to have that passion for the people, your players and for the game. And then that, that comes out. They, people feel that. To be an NFL quarterback, like you were, you quarterbacked, Bills, Panthers, Jets, Lions, um, got 85 to 98. So you were probably a stud on your high school team, stud in college, and then you go to the NFL. And I, I'm always fascinated when I ask guys this. When was the first time in your career as a player that you were in practice or on the field with another quarterback and thought, oh, I'm not the best one here. <laughs> oh, my God, this guy's going to. Yeah, that's an easy answer. Um, that was in 1986 when uh, in my second year in the league and we signed Jim Kelly and he threw uh, our first practice. He threw a couple footballs and I said, Oh my goodness. I mean, I certainly watched these guys play on top. You know, my rookie year, I obviously saw Dan Marino play 
um, so on and so forth. But, um, you know, just being at practice with another guy um, and, and seeing that done, seeing throws made on an everyday basis was, yeah, I, I knew that there were, I, I knew that there were some guys that were just physically a cut above the rest of us. I actually grew up, the first quarterback I fell in love with, I grew up in Seattle, was Warren Moon. And I always tell my audience about twice a year, go YouTube Warren Moon 35 yeah. years ago. Yeah. He'd be the number one pick. It, it was insane. He could run. He had a cannon. Yeah. Speaking of personnel, um, Darius Leonard got picked, and I went back knowing that you were going to be on, and there were people like, who's Darius Leonard? This isn't a great pick. And then literally immediately, I went back when he arrived with the Colts. And, you know, the, the early reviews are, oh, good Lord, this guy's incredible. When you, you make the pick, you obviously had seen him. You talked about it. But go back to the first, like a practice with a Darius Leonard, and you're just like, you now you don't want to tell him. You don't want to shout it. But you whisper to somebody, oh, what did we get our hands on here? Yeah, it, it was immediate because – of two things, you know, one, like he, he steps out on the field and really it's not just on the field, it's anywhere. And he just had this guy, we talk about juice and energy and nobody has it like Darius. Okay. There, nobody, I've never been around anybody like this guy. He steps on the field and the whole field lights up. I mean, he just has, he has that much juice and love and passion for the game that I know we all do, but he just got a way about him that is special. Um, and then secondly, you know, yes, he's physically talented. There's a lot of guys physically talented, but he's got that gift of seeing a play happen before it happens, you know, like knowing what's going to happen. And he's there. And then he has the, the length and the attitude to finish plays. And the great thing about Darius is, He's proven it in the years, in the three years that he's been here. Well, what, what, I mean, it's not just making a million tackles. It's causing fumbles, recovering fumbles, making interceptions, and sacking the quarterback. He does everything. I mean, he, he can make plays at every level, and he makes them consistently, and he's done that for three straight years. Um, one more. I thought it was kind of a, a really neat moment a couple, maybe 10 days ago. And they asked Nick Foles about your situation. And Nick thinks so highly of you. And then you think so highly of Nick. <laughs> you know, and I'm on the air and I'm like, huh. I said, these guys, like, let's just get it together, okay? Like, let's have the reunion tour. Let's not, <laughs> not waste any time. They both love each other. And then, you know, somebody came on my show and they said, you know, you want to respect your quarterback, but, you know, you got to win games in this league. Was the Nick Foles talk real? Your, your admiration for him. His for you, your early schedule, Carson's injury. We know the relationship. We know the Philly story. Is that a walking on eggshells thing for you? Are you comfortable with it? Where do you land on that? Yeah, I'm real comfortable with it. I'm real, I'm real comfortable gushing about a player and person that I think very highly about. So all the things that I say are real and authentic. And I, I feel those guys and, and I feel them. And I, I root for Nick incredibly hard. Um, you know, right now, going back to your our earlier comment is, you know, he plays, he's under contract with the Bears. Um, and we have two guys and three guys, three other guys in camp who are making progress. And so I, I don't know any other way to deal with it other than to, you know, respect the process and uh, allow, you know, I, I think we all think the best case scenario is, you know, grow your, you know, you draft guys, you develop them, they're ready to go. Um, so I think you have to give things time and, but you have to trust the process and that's what we're doing. Great having you on Frank, total pro, easy guy to root for. I know you're busy. Always appreciate opportunities to talk to smart guys and I appreciate it. Thanks, Colin. Thanks for having me on. Mm -hmm.